Okay. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the last session of the day. So we're here at the end of the um, social policy strand, which has been jointly done with the IOI Social Policy Forum and the uh, Institute of Ideas Parents Forum. My name is Jane Sandsman, and I'm the convener of the uh, Institute of Ideas Parents Forum. And it means just a bit about the forum means regular, a regular basis in central London, and it discusses the kind of issues we're discussing today. So hopefully, people are interested in that. They'd be interested in coming along to the discussions. I'll explain how the session will run, introduce the session, and introduce the speakers in the order in which they will speak. So each speaker will speak for five minutes. We have a brief panel discussion. Uh, discussion opens the floor, a number of questions, come back to the speakers, uh, and so on. And then the speakers will sum up at the end. Um, so I think the session fits into the themes we have been exploring in the strand today. If people have uh, continued through the whole um, strand. I think the whole notion of responsible fatherhood is that one that has risen from the evidence. So I think that is um, very much where the notion comes. Uh, if one looks at Rob's Fatherhood Institute website, it has summaries of what the evidence implies for how fathers should behave. And sort of five minute, these are sort of evidence and this shows the outcomes in relationship to um, what fathers can do. And um, I, I think the other aspect perhaps which is explored in the big society, which is, and, and again came up in um, the early intervention, which is there is a tension between autonomy, there is a notion that families should stand on their own two feet, you know, and that. Uh, is quite a popular one. You know, the Tories talk about family, um, you know, very much seen as a, a social unit and one that should be quite strong. But then there is the trajectory of social policy asserting a prescriptive notion of what family should be. So there does seem to be these sort of two tensions that um, are coming up uh, within a discussion of social policy. And the interesting, <laughs> I think, um, well, for men, what about men too? At last, this is their session because. Um, fathers have increasingly become the focus of social policy and we saw um, the Tories have uh, given their indication on the coalition that there should be extended paternity leave um, and certainly the discussion of the absent father is uh, still one that's very current in um, social policy. So I'm very fortunate to have four great panellists uh, who will examine what fatherhood means today and I'll introduce them in the order in which they will speak. So the first speaker a woman in the panel, is Dr Ellie Lee. Um, she's a senior lecturer of so in social policy at the University of Kent. Um, Kelly, uh, Ellie has written extensively on abortion, motherhood, intensive parenting, and pertinently for this session, male postnatal depression. Um, she set up the research network Parenting Culture Studies in 2007, which has a website, and through its website and through a series of ESRC-funded seminar seminars, created a cross-disciplinary investigation into the sociological significance of parenting today. And I, I really do recommend people to go along to the website. It's, it's got you know, reading materials, it's got loads of information, and there are um, some seminars still continuing. And they are fantastic, um, you know, very enlightening for anyone. So it's not, people don't have to be academics at all. I go, and I'm not an academic by any random means, but really get um, a lot out of those. Um, second speaker, so second speaker is Rob, who's sitting next to Ellie. Rob Williams is Chief Executive of the Fatherhood Institute, which is the UK think tank on the changing role of fathers. Um, and he has had a you know, very depth of career. He's been the Deputy Children's Commissioner for England and is on board of trustees of UNICEF UK. So he's a breadth of experience both nationally and internationally around the realities that affect children. And the very thing I really do like about Rob is, like me, he's a qualified accountant. So we are flying the flag for accountants who are not necessarily just the bean counters of the stereotype of cultural imagination. So um, the third speaker who is here, to my left, is Professor Richard Collier, who is a professor of law and social theory at Newcastle University, but is not a lawyer, he wishes to emphasize. So don't ask him questions on conveyancing. <laughs> Richard's primary research interests concern questions around law and gender with a particular focus on issues surrounding men and masculinities. His latest book, so hopefully people have got the flyer for his latest book, which is Men, Law and Gender, Essays on the Man of Law, which has been recently published by Rookridge. And it, I've, my preparation this week has been reading some of Richard's articles and they're just tremendous, they're, again, such depth, giving me enough topics for parents' forum, I think, for the next <laughs> few 
like mums, like, you know, just like every sentence, thinking, oh my goodness, I never thought about it like that. So, uh, very pleased to welcome Richard. The fourth speaker, who I can't see very well, but there is right at the end, is David Yelland, who was editor of The Sun for five years, and I think uh, people might recognise him as quite a public face. He's on the board of the NSPCC and the National Campaign for the Arts. Um, Penguin published his first novel, The Truth About Leo, which is on Bookstall at the conference. And the central core of the novel is a relationship between a father and a son. And now I, I, it's a great novel, it's a children's novel, but like all best children's novels, it is actually um, very readable uh, by adults. And you know, it's a very enjoyable book, and I go to more book clubs than you can shake a stick at, so I don't give that prize praise lightly. So um, I think with more ado, Ellie. Okay, thanks, Jane, for the uh, fine comments about parenting culture studies. Um, from my reading of things, there are two main parts to social policy on the family uh, when it comes to fatherhood. One is to do with changing the workplace and changing the nature of work and the father's relationship with the workplace. And the other is providing information. Um, in terms of my own work and research, it's the second of these that I've spent quite a lot of time looking at. So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about in my short allotted space and just say a little bit about the nature of informing the father. Um, just before I do that though, I would suggest that I think there's an overall common theme of the work in policy in these two areas. And what I would describe it as, is, to use a sociological term, is, is an attempt to intensify fatherhood. Um, so to make fatherhood uh, a more intensive, and fathering, uh, a more intensive process and experience. And what I mean by this, is that I think policy is aiming to create a situation where fathers not only spend a lot more time with their children, but also it's attempting to shape the nature of what fathers do with that time, and to make the time spent with fathers a different type of time, um, done doing different things um, to what has previously been the case, or at least what policy makers think has previously been the case. So policy, in my reading of it, seeks not so much to increase what we might think is leisure time, that's to say just to create more free time for fathers, away from work, to spend time doing whatever they want to with their kids and having fun with them. But it's to increase time um, spent on what we might call fathering, in inverted commas, a type of parenting akin to mothering. Um, and in policy, um, and in terms of what these activities constitute, I would argue that parenting, fathering and mothering constitute something quite specific. And not just about parents, be they mothers or fathers, spending time with their children doing whatever they think is the right thing. Parenting, and mothering and fathering as versions of this, uh, is to do with the time parents spend with their children doing things that others think are the things that they should be doing. Um, and my argument would be is that the aim of policy uh, is to increase the time spent on fathering uh, as opposed to simply increasing leisure time. And just to say where I'm coming from on all of this, I'm favourable um, to an increase in leisure time um, I'm not favourable to an increase in fathering time, and I think the two are quite different things. And I would argue that the attempt to increase fathering time constitutes what I would call uh, an attempt to deauthorise the parent. Um, it's an attempt to supplant and uh, replace uh, the authority of the parent and the idea on the part of the parent about what they think they should be doing and how, think they, should, how they think they should be spending their time with their children um, with another type of idea which is much more driven um, by expert and external views um, about what people should spend their time doing. So as I say, I'm not going to say anything about the change in the workplace side. On information, um, the work that I've done on information actually begins with looking at the type of information mothers are giving, given and the process of increasing information to mothers um, and uh, developing what policymakers call informed choice about varying, various mothering practices. The ones that I've looked at specifically are to do with feeding babies uh, and specifically trying to increase the propensity of mothers to breastfeed their baby um, and also the issue of alcohol and pregnancy, so in increasing mothers' informed choice toward alcohol, uh, which is the choice, the informed choice is to abstain from alcohol um, when you're having pregnancy um, and when pregnant, so they're the two issues I've, I've looked at. Now when it comes to dads, there's loads and loads of information targeted at fathers about lots and lots of different things. I wouldn't dispute the utility of some of it, and some of it is certainly factual information. But I would also, there is, also argue there is a definitive trend to simply expand the type of information which has already been given to mothers for, for, for a very, very long time now to fathers, um, to, to simply expand and basically bifurcate 
um, this type of information. I would see this type of process of informing fathers as very similar to that which has happened to mothers, which isn't really about informing. It's actually about attempting to get parents to toe the line um, in relation to certain um, prescribed parenting practices which are deemed by external authorities to be the right ones and the best ones. So I wouldn't call this proper information and I certainly wouldn't call it evidence-based information because certainly the cases that I've looked at when it comes to mothers um, in relation to feeding their babies and in relation to alcohol in pregnancy, the information isn't based on evidence insofar as it is it's highly one-sided and its effect for mothers um, in terms of their everyday experience of ra raising their children, I would say has been on balance quite negative. Um, I think breastfeeding promotion and what's happened around alcohol have both been fairly detrimental um, in terms of the experience of mothers. This has now been ex expanded to fathers, so if you look at the information that's available for fathers on breastfeeding, it simply trumpets exactly the same line, which is breastfeeding is best and everything that you should do should be about encouraging your partner to breastfeed. Um, and that's what it says. It doesn't say anything about the legitimacy of bottle feeding. It doesn't say anything about the negative effects which women often experience with attempting to breastfeed their babies for the prescribed amount of time. None of that is in the literature at all. It's simply a directional message that you should support your partner to breastfeed. On alcohol and pregnancy, you find exactly the same thing, simply a duplication of the type of information that's already been given to women um, transferred over to men. So to say it's very important that your partner doesn't drink when she's pregnant, and what you need to do is to support her in her abstinence by maybe being abstinent yourself. Um, and that's the policy message directed at fathers. So my take on all of this is that I can't see it going any other way. Um, than reproducing the same type of problems which mothers have experienced under this type of informed choice policy regime, duplicating that for fathers. But I think it actually does something worse because it's bad enough, you see, for mothers um, to be given this type of information by um, health officials and by policy makers. But at least you know that they're external to you. You know, they're not your nearest and dearest. For policy, I think, to attempt to get inside the relationship between partners, to get inside the relationship between the nearest and dearest. And as far as I can see, essentially use the father as a vector for attempting to influence the mother's choices um, and the mother's experience is something which I would see as being very destructive um, of the family unit um, and of the relationship between the mother and the father. So in that sense, by and large, I think that we need to do a lot more to look at all of this, a lot more to bring to light the problems that is already creating. I mean, there's plenty of reports around already um, and women, you know, secretly having a glass of wine, getting into rows with their partners. Plenty of reports now of women feeling pressurised by their partners into carrying on breastfeeding when they really don't want to. And I think this is all the stuff that we need to start bringing to light and have a lot more to say on because of its destructive effects for relationships between uh, mums and dads. All right, thanks. Um, thank you very much. That was very interesting. Um, but I won't check out what I'm going to say. I won't come back to a lot of that. Um, dads are doing a lot more childcare than they used to. They're doing loads more. Uh, there was a study about 10 years ago that showed that since the 1970s, the amount of time dads spend with their children had gone up by 800%, which is amazing. Um, but a statistic you should treat with some caution, because the starting point in the early 1970s was 15 minutes a day that on average dads were spending with their children. And by the beginning of this century, that had gone up to two hours a day, um, which still isn't massive, and was at that stage a lot less than the time that mothers were spending with their children. But the change continues, mm -hmm. and last summer, Roundtree produced a, a very good um, timely study that showed that dads were spending, in their study, five hours a day with their children. So massive changes, really enormous. Um, and it's largely happening on its own. There hasn't been a big campaign certainly not a government campaign, to get dads to spend that much more time with their children. Certainly not in the 70s, 80s or 90s. The pressure for dads to spend more time with their children comes from two areas, I think. One is that you know, dads are actually quite interested in their children. Um, and also, mums are spending a lot more time at work. The great battle of the 60s and 70s, equality at work, equal pay, and that amazing film about the, the women in Dagenham, uh, was a big change. If women have equality in the workforce, if they're doing more work, then that would imply <coughs> that they're doing less at home and dads are coming in to fill the gap. It's happened in every industrialised country. So you will not find a high-income country where dads 
haven't increased the amount of childcare they're doing in the last 30 to 40 years. But in this country, it's actually happening slower. We're publishing an index next month which looks across 21 upper income countries how much time men and women are spending with their children. And we're actually very low down the league table. And it's happened much quicker in other countries. And I think it's happening slower here because despite it all, despite the fact that we now really believe in equality, <coughs> we still have a system that treats parenting as basically an activity that's really focused on a mother and a child. And the father's role in parenting is really to be the breadwinner. Now I know that's not what most young couples think when they start talking about having children. And when we survey young people and we say, all of these jobs that you might end up doing, nappy changing, buying clothes for your child, making friends in your area, checking out local nurseries, should that be mostly the mother's job or mostly the father's job? And a survey we did in March, almost all of them said it should be equal. We should be doing that equally. And on a scale of one to 10, where it was one is mostly mum, 10 is mostly dad. The vast majority of the respondents are plumped for a score around five or six. And when we asked them very meanly, the ones who already had children, so how is it working out in your relationship? Who's doing most of it? It moved, the responses moved much towards the mostly mother end of the spectrum. So although people aspire to much more shared parenting, they're not really achieving that. <laughs> And I think it's because we're surrounded, parents are surrounded by all kinds of assumptions and pressures about what mothers and fathers are for. Um, we have a maternity leave system that allows a mother a year off work and allows a father two weeks off work. And that really is sending a message. The business of this, this toddler, this infant, is really the mother's business. And it's great if dad can be around for two weeks, but you really need to get back to work now because the one who's really important in this role is the mother. When we read papers in the stories about obese children or children who are failing at school, the headline often has mums who go to work have fat children or mums who go to work have children failing at school. There's a huge assumption behind that that actually when a mother goes to work she's, she's going against what we would generally expect and what we assume is best for the child. Most of those obese children have fathers who go to work. But we don't see headlines that say dads who work have fat children. Because dads are not being held responsible for their children in the same way that mothers are being held responsible for their children. We police motherhood. And we police fatherhood. The dads who fail in our media are the dads who are factors, who don't go to work and who don't provide the money for their family. And the mums who fail in the media, they're the ones who go to work. All this progress that we've made about understanding of gender and men and women's roles is, is I think, although it's important, is not completely grounded yet in our culture. I would like to see a future where we at least have a system that's neutral, that allows a mother and a father to choose, genuinely have a choice about which one of them is going to stay at home and which one of them is going to work, or how they match up their parenting and breadwinning responsibilities more equally. So let's have a maternity and paternity leave system that protects the mother's health at the very beginning, but let's convert the rest of that leave into leave that either parent can use because they have a right to. We have a child benefit system that gives money to mothers and not to fathers on the basis that actually it's the mothers who are really responsible for those children. Now that might well have been the case when that system was first introduced immediately after the Second World War, but I would argue that the logic behind that is is really rather shaky at the moment. So I'd like to go a lot further. I think rather than us being the policy focus, men, fatherhood being a policy focus, we still have a system which is directing most of its energy towards the mother. Um, so I'd like to move at least to a neutral system. We could go further. There's some great evidence that shows if, if parents share... Oh, sorry. Just one more point. In Sweden, which is a great country, as we all know, uh, studies have shown the more that parents share their parenting equally, the more they have a balance, each of them does childcare and each of them works, then the more likely they are to express satisfaction with their relationship. And the more likely that relationship is to be durable over time. So whereas similar studies in the 50s showed that there's a male breadwinner and a female homemaker, that was likely to result in the most satisfaction from the partner. 
That paradigm has completely changed now. The more sharing we can do, the more likely we are to have happy couples and stable families. And our policy framework at the moment simply doesn't support that in any way. In fact, it works against it. Hello, uh, I'm Richard Collier and I love conveyancing, so any questions? <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, as Jane said, my interest in this really comes from issues around masculinities, law and fatherhood. Uh, and as I say, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, this was the question Jane asked us to consider. What are fathers in 2010? What does social policy want fatherhood to be? Has the perception and role of the father changed in the last 50 years? And then she put in her email, and I think significantly, obviously this is not a black and white issue. And it seems to me that that's exactly right, and that there is a need in this area to move beyond what has often been a very polarised discussion. And I'm not sure if that kind of polarising is something that Rob's come across in his work at the Fatherhood Institute. In, ter in terms of what we do know, it sometimes seems that we know a great deal and yet maybe not so much, whereby notwithstanding this vast volume of research on fathering, there's little theory, little data on the everyday experiences, the spaces of fatherhood, what goes on here. I wonder then if a policy debate on fatherhood has often rested on questionable assumptions on the part of policymakers and politicians about what fathers should be doing rather than what they actually are doing. And I wonder about which fathers we're actually talking about in this debate. So what kind of assumptions about class, race, ethnicity, sexuality, physical ability, stage of the life course, have informed the views of policy makers and politicians, and certainly much of the media images of a good father? So in this brief intro, I just want to raise two themes that it seems to me maybe we could talk about in the discussion. One, I wonder if policies have been marked by contradictory messages not just about whether and in what way families need fathers, but also about how dominant cultural ideas about fatherhood connect to assumptions about heterosexuality, masculinity. Far from finding one model of fatherhood in policy, maybe it's more accurate to talk about different ideas about fatherhood being used across different policy contexts. So in a debate about you know, engaging fathers in families, you get different kinds of assumptions about what fathers are for compared to what you might find in conversations about crime and social order. So I think there may be no one model of good fatherhood that's actually circulating here. Linked to that, fatherhood has been deeply politicised over the last 20 or so years. And that's not just a matter of the high-profile public political debates about issues of fathers' rights around contact and residence, though that is certainly very important, and I'm sure, again, Rob's been part of those debates. What I'm thinking of is political dimensions of fatherhood in relation to assisted reproduction, unmarried dads, welfare, men's violence. So, how has the rise of equality agendas reshaped our ideas about fatherhood in all of those contexts? And how can we make sense of an apparent gap between law and policy's central message, it would seem to be, fathers are valued, fathers are important, and yet what still the realities of many dads' actual experiences of law and legal systems, which would seem to be something different. So first point, concept politics. Second point, I wonder if issues around emotion and intimacy have been curiously absent from a lot of these policy debates. And I think Jane is absolutely right. Jane said in her notes of the session, there is a worrying assumption at play that fathers do not love their kids. I think there's a wealth of evidence that they do. And that's one reason why I think recent work on fatherhood, intimacy, and personal life is very important. There was an argument made by a sociologist called Esther Dermott, and she argued that what we need to do is move beyond narrow formulations of fathers, beyond narrow formulations of fathers, as either failing to contribute or as sidelined from family life. What we need to do is question these ideas that fathers are a kind of cause of all these social problems or else the solution to these social problems. So to conclude, I hope we're okay for time, Jane. I wonder, at the end of the day, maybe there is a deep uncertainty in society about whether families do or do not need fathers because of the distinctive gendered qualities that men are seen to bring to the parenting role. So, is it possible to recognise what mothers and fathers may share 
to address the interconnected nature of our lives as women and men, and importantly children, whilst also recognising, going back to something in Ellie's paper, that social experiences are gendered in complex ways. So can policymakers and politicians understand the social political significance of, say, the rise of pro-father, father's rights agendas? by not reducing them to the level of a backlash to feminism, whilst, and a linking to Ellie's observations, at the same time recognising the complex and often contradictory consequences that these policy changes have had for many mothers and children. Ultimately, I think Ellie's right that what may be emerging here is a new form of regulation of fatherhood. And that's a question that raises issues about politics and society as much as it does any consensus about fathers and child welfare. Not least, I must say, going back to the economics of all this, of what will happen to fathering practices in the present economic climate and what all of this is going to mean for being a doting dad. Thanks. Um, hello, that, um, that was really interesting, actually. I'm going to come back. Uh, um, I think it's very interesting. I think we're, uh, this is a very interesting time uh, in this country uh, with respect to this issue and, and the, the way that fatherhood is looked at, perceived and, and written about um, and we've sort of, if you look at the political uh, leaders of all, of all three parties um, over the last uh, parliament and then also the current one, they almost define themselves uh, as fathers um, it was very much true with Gordon Brown's leaving uh, speech in, in, in Down Street uh, is clearly true of David Cameron um, um, was certainly true of Tony Blair um, and um, we know a little bit less about Ed Miliband because he's more private um, which may be no bad thing um, but that doesn't mean that the uh, social that the uh, that, that policy has moved but it does mean uh, that the um, environment for policy to change rapidly is there so uh, that's why I think this debate is very important, because I think it's a debate that could lead to rapid change, um, as, I was, as I understand was understood in, uh, was discussed in the uh, big society uh, debate earlier. I should start off by saying, I think, that although I'm, I am a former editor of The Sun, um, I actually have more faith in public policy, I think, than, 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 than some of the members of the panel. Um, and I'm a... Uh, <laughs> I'm, um, I'm a, a veteran of some wars here in MMR, for example, in which um, the son under my leadership was very much pro getting the, getting the, uh, the, 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 the vaccine. Um, and I, I, I think if you look around British society, uh, what's happened to us in the last century, the big advances in terms of life expectancy, uh, the move away from poverty, at least in the, you know, the, the second half of the last century, were all due to uh, great movements of, of, of the social policy the kinds of things that have now become completely unfashionable and we now rely on big society without actually doing it, you know, without actually forcing people to do things that they don't want to do, which is, is, is I'm afraid, what you have to do uh, to, to, uh, 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 to advance uh, um, uh, a people, a country. Um, as far as father fatherhood is concerned, um, um, I... Uh, for many years, for a number of years, I've been a single father, um, and uh, I was dis discussing this earlier, actually. I could talk all afternoon about it, but I think the, the one thing I would say is the experience, the cliche is it brings out your feminine side. The more, uh, perhaps the more academic way to put it is that it makes feminists of us all, because um, uh, the fact is most fathers are not the last line of defense. Uh, for most fathers, uh, it is possible to spend some part of the day, if not, if not a couple of days on a business trip, without the fact that you have children figuring much in the front lobe of your, of your brain. It isn't possible to do that as a single father, even if you have all kinds of support around you, which I do. Um, it, it, is a, it, is a, it, is a, it is a constant uh, concern, fear and joy. Uh, and that is the definition, I think, of being... Uh, of being a mother, and I don't think that that's, that could ever be understood by most fathers. It certainly was not understood by me when I was a father before um, uh, before Max's mother uh, passed away. Um, I, 
I also think that um, it's important to say in my five minutes a little bit about the media. Um, uh, obviously, as editor of The Sun, I was very front and centre in terms of, 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 the, uh, of this. And I know from experience, you know, I would, I would have to have lunch with the editor of the Daily Mail twice a year as part of my, um, uh, part of my job on the one-on-one. So I know absolutely uh, that the fact is that uh, uh, the media in this country, uh, or most of the media, is quite happy to um, uh, promulgate and promote a certain way of bringing up children. Uh, because it plays to the fears of the middle classes, uh, and you can make money. You can make a lot of money in this country out of scaring the middle classes. People have done it for many, many years, and it'll, it will continue for, for many years. But the reality is that all parents, uh, I think, for all generations, have effectively made it up as they go along, because that is the reality of life. Nobody, no one who has a first child has ever had a child before, um, and um, so the, the reality is that that. that there is no such thing as the right way to do something. But that doesn't mean um, that the state doesn't have a role. And that doesn't mean that public policy uh, doesn't have a role. It certainly has a role, in my view, in, in, in consumption and alcohol during pregnancy. Uh, because um, if it pushes back 2 to 3% on the number of women that drink excessively in pregnancy, then that saves lives. Um, and the final thing I would say is um, I was adopted in the uh, 1960s. Um, at a time when there were hundreds of thousands of children that were adopted. Uh, and um, I know that the state is imperfect, public policy is imperfect, uh, but um, I'm extremely grateful that it exists and existed then. Um, and I think there's, there, the time that we're coming into in this country, it is going to be essential uh, that, uh, that we operate the best possible public policy because uh, it isn't just about lives being at stake we're dealing with children, and that is lives and the lives of their children. Because the kinds of problems we're trying to avoid are generational, uh, hugely costly to society, uh, and uh, national embarrassments, frankly, if we don't get them right. Okay. Uh, so, thank you, Pat. <laughs> I mean, I can ask a question, but does anyone want to, do any of the panel want to comment on? Okay, thanks, Ali. Ellie's chairing vicariously. <laughs> okay, I'll put on my glasses so I can see. Go out to the floor. Is that, yeah, Stuart. Yeah, um, I'm wondering. I mean, I think I agree that I think um, maternity leave, paternity leave should be the same. That seems just sensible to me. But the thing I worry about is. Um, are we creating two mums to be a sexist about it, if you know what I mean? Because is there not, was there not, is there not something good about the person who works that that's their identity? It's almost like you're bringing the public world into your house if you're a worker and you think of yourself as a worker. But you do something outside, because the home is meant to be a kind of caring institution, but the father historically was kind of he would come home from work and that meant something. He would be a certain type of individual, which was probably a bit tough, and all the rest of it. So there's a certain robustness of what a father was because he was a worker. And are we kind of trying to create a house full of mums where that's all they are? Because that seems to lose something, potentially, for me, that you're bringing into the Um, just a, a question, really. Um, Rob, I think you said that in the 1970s, fathers spent 15 minutes with their children, and today they spend two hours um, with their children, or maybe up to five yeah. hours. Um, and I was just wondering, um, is this uh, really um, also about um, a new view of what parenting should be, and what happens to the children just spending some time on their own? Um, and you know, where does that fit into this? Fathers have to spend so much time, mothers have to spend so much time uh, with their children. Lady in red. I've got two questions. The first is, um, uh, my, my concern with what I think is sort of happening to some fathers 
um, or to fatherhood as a kind of phenomenon, is that whereas uh, even not that long ago, in fact, when I had a uh, first child, um, there was a it was kind of relatively sanctioned that the father could be a sort of bulwark against the neuroses of the mother, uh, especially around the anxieties about the well-being of the child and the health and the feeding and the pregnancy and all that kind of blah blah. blah. And um, I just really worry that that once that goes, that all, what you have is a little unit focusing <laughs> on <you> neurotic <laughs> about the well-being of this child. And um, I, and I have to say, I, I thankfully haven't experienced it, but I've heard from other people. You know, of examples like Ellie was saying, you know, women coming under a lot of pressure from husbands to breastfeed when they really were reluctant uh, to not drink or to, you know, being told off for eating the wrong foods during pregnancy and that kind of thing. And I, just, I, I obviously, I think that's incredibly undermining for a kind of relationship, or a future parental relationship. Goodness, how do you then parent a ch co parent a child in those circumstances? Um, but also, obviously, it, it gives you kind of feeling of pit of your stomach for the woman, actually, and a very unfortunate position for the man to be in as well. Then the other question is, what um, <laughs> if, the, if both parents are kind of engaged in the intimate role, how do you make kids fear you? <laughs> which is something we come up all, my little son and I keep coming up with all the time, which is, these kids just don't, aren't scared of us. How the hell, do, which one of us is going to be the one they're scared of? But because you're both drawn into being intimate and lovely with them all the time, you want rich experiences and none of that. It's the distance that makes it possible to have authority, I think, in many ways. And, I, and neither of us particularly wants to be that person. But how do you, how do, you do that without really role-playing a kind of previous era's model of, of fatherhood? I'm going, to, I'm going to abuse the privilege of chair just, just in relation to that and perhaps Stuart's question, so maybe we should ask that question to the panel, because I think certainly three of the panellists have said it isn't the same as, you know, farmers aren't the same as 50 years ago, so I, so I just you know, maybe throw that through, and, and, and so is it that we just have to just, you know, Rob does say you know, and this isn't because fathers are being beaten to play more with their children, they are playing more with their children. I think fathers are looking, as women are, looking not only to their public sphere, but to their private sphere. So the father's lived experience, I would argue, that's not having done research, is um, a different one from, you know, down the mines in Newcastle, father knows his place and, <coughs> and mother knows her place, or father is a disability. Here is a role in which we have to play and all this play out. So, so perhaps to queer some of the pictures of the questions from the floor, do, do, you know, do we just put this sort of, these relationships have to remain despite social movement, social changes, and social policy in no way can address or look at the changing role of men? I shall, uh, I'll come back, I'll do the panel and then come back. I've got some questions that go. And so, Richard, I'll just go through them. Thanks. There's such um, sort of great questions. Thanks. I, I, I hear something similar in the first and in the, in the final question there. This is about are we creating two mums? And that lovely phrase you said about fathers as a bulwark against the anxieties of the mother. And th this this makes me think about how do we how do we understand what's sort of distinctive and gendered, if anything, about what dads do? And I, I struggle with that. And it seems to me that. If you go into the areas of the home and the family, say, with new labour, there was a kind of policy optimism here. This is the bit where dads are kind of interchangeable with mums in the interest of the child's welfare. And here there's an optimism. Men want to change. Men are changing. So that gender thing, if you like, there's gender neutrality is there. But if you go into other policy areas, let's say around crime or social order, policy debates are informed by different kinds of assumptions about what dads are for. So there you're getting this idea of you need dad as the disciplinarian, the male role model, the person who's contributing something. And I think we, we're we still dealing in both of these ideas in different areas. And I think I, I take that from both your questions. And also, just one point there, looking to how we... I think we have to be very careful in how we read the past in all of this. And we talk about this idea of the new father, as this, whatever that might be. Well, that's made up of different kinds of ideas, assumptions about dads and rights about dads and care, about dads as economic providers, about dads as a kind of supporter of the mother, if you like. So there's all these little components of what's going on. And that, what I got from that Steve Humphreys, the BBC4 series recently, uh, and lots of historical work on that, is that we can't assume that dads in the past weren't hands-on, that they weren't doing these things, 
So there's a complexity there. So for questions one and two, I take that as questions about gender difference, how we understand it. And absolutely, I love that, you know, once that goes, what does that mean for mothers? Uh, I'm rambling, it's late in the day. <laughs> um, they were great questions. I, I think the period of history where men left the home to go to work, whilst women stayed at home to look after children, um, has been relatively brief. Um, if you go back six or seven hundred years, where most people live in small land holdings, where men and women were both cultivating and looking after the children, you'd find that actually what they were really doing wasn't that different. They were both engaged in running that small holding. And if you're a blacksmith, you work downstairs and the kids are running around upstairs, your, your wife might be going out uh, and you might find yourself with the kids. It's only industrialization. If you want factories where people work from nine to five, and if you want men to join up and have enormous armies that obviously leave home to go and fight people elsewhere, you have to convince men that that's fine, you can do that. And you have to convince women it's fine for that bloke to go away because actually you're the one who has got that essential skill that all children need. Um, I, I think we get into trouble if we tell parents how they should run their family. So if we say, mum at home, dad at work, that's being overly prescriptive. If we say both of you stay at home at all times, then that's also prescriptive. Um, if we give people the choice, some people, it really does work to have a breadwinner and a carer. That's what makes them happy. Um, and I do meet couples who say that. But for most couples, they'd like to have more of a choice. Um, and is it essential to discipline that one of you is not there very much, uh, so that when you come back, you haven't got the intimacy with your child that might prevent you from setting boundaries, which is the modern phrase for telling kids off. Um, I don't think so. I think there is a way of parenting which is both intimate and authoritative, and there's lots of literature about authoritative parenting as being emotionally supportive, but also very clear about boundaries. Um, and I don't know what the answer is to the... It was a really insightful point. Are we just demanding that parents spend more and more time with their children? Are we worried to leave them on their own? The, the figures show that parents are indeed spending more time with their children. And at the same time as that, they're spending much less time outside. Uh, I think the range of 12-year-olds' um, external ventures without their parents has come down from something like half a mile to 400 metres in the last 20 years. It's a huge problem. And I don't think it's a, it's a gender one. I think it's much more about our anxieties. Um, we do make loads of money out of making parents anxious. And if the vision of the future is that you both have an anxious mother and an anxious father, that would be appalling. I think we need to tell parents, really, it's up to you. You have the choice. We'll structure leave arrangements and work arrangements so you can figure it out. And we're not going to bash you if your child falls off the chair or the swing. Um, I think we need to relax a lot more about parenting, which also involves us being relaxed about whether it's the father or mother who provides most of the time. Okay, so you'll be revising quite a bit of the literature on your website then. <laughs> about what? Well, I mean, I read the stuff that you've got on your website, uh, this document, for example, Maternal Infant Health and Perinatal Period and Farmers' Role. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's endless amounts, sorry, endless amounts of stuff in here, Fathers Affect the Health of the Mother and Infant Breastfeeding, which, as I say, is just all going on and on and on about the role of the father. Well, that's precisely my point, and this brings me to want to actually re respond to, to one of your comments. I mean, hang on, I'm, I'm not opposed to social policy. I mean, not saying anything you know, generically. Nobody could just be opposed to social policy. I do think there's something very, very distinct happening to social policy at the moment, and has been happening for some time, which is social policy is not about society anymore. Social policy isn't about the social. Social policy is becoming about changing the way individuals think and the way individuals feel and the way individuals relate to other people, in particular to their nearest and dearest. And it's happening in all sorts of areas of social policy, uh, but what we have as a specific development, which is the one that I'm most interested in, is the emergence of parenting policy as a specific type of social policy, which seeks to do exactly this. It seeks to change the way in which people parent. So parent is no longer a noun, it is a verb. Parenting is a specific type of activity, and what it is guided by is a set of ideas about what it means to be a parent and what parents should be doing. Now, obviously, parenting is an apparently gender-neutral term. 
So the concept parenting clearly entails ideas about fathering as well as ideas about mothering. <laughs> now, people can, I think, make the mistake of thinking that this has got something to do with equality. So because this term is apparently gender neutral and this is something to do with equality, I don't think this has anything to do with social equality, I don't, or not in the way that I understand social equality anyway. I think this is to do with creating a situation where, well, I suppose you do make mothers and dads equal, but more in the way that Jan described, which is that you make both individual parents equally subject to messages about how they should relate to each other and their children. That's the version of equality that we now have. Now, the extent to which that works itself through, I think, is a question from empirical investigation is a very interesting one. My own feeling at the moment is that the extent to which fathers are as influenced by this agenda and are as open to the messages about what constitutes the right parenting style is much less than mothers. In other words, I think that mothers are still more prone to anxiety and concern and worry um, than fathers are. Um, I think in general fathers, you know, don't seem to be as persuaded by the fact that they should read all the books about rhyme time with dad, reading to your children, how to discipline your children, go to positive parenting classes and all of this type of stuff. But you know, I think that there is change afoot. I think more fathers are influenced by this stuff. And my point is, is that I think it's having a destructive effect on the family. Because it's very individualizing. It creates tensions between individuals within the family. And I think it ceases to think about the context, the primary context in which we rear children, as being a family and its relationships to the wider society. So I think it's a very distinctive type of construct that we've now got in the relationship between parents, children, social policy and the wider society. So that's my big, you know, I'm not, the, I'm, I'm, all, I'm massively in favour of vaccination programmes. I think they're a good thing. I'm massively in favour of all versions of public health interventions in the past. I'm massively in favour of building more houses, for example. What I'm not favourable towards is policies which seek to get inside people's individual psychology, their emotion, and which seek to reconstruct their relationships with others around them, primarily their partners and their children, which I think is what's happening. Yes, I mean, um, slightly odd that former Murdoch editor is uh, arguing uh, uh, what would appear to be a, a, a left-wing interventionist case, cause. But um, I remember uh, as a young journalist in Middlesbrough and the Northern, Northern Echo um, hearing that there, that there was, a, on the grapevine in the Cleveland, what was then the Cleveland Police Force, that there was an investigation into something called child abuse. Um, and not knowing what it was. I was very young then. Uh, most of the people in the country didn't know what it was. And, then, and that was the beginning of, the, of, the, of, the, of, of what became the first big uh, uh, child abuse scandal in this country. And of course, we've seen that happen. Uh, uh, you know, now, now we've gone to the other extreme where we think that any, any adult that almost looks at the child in the playground might be, you know, a child, you know we've gone way over the... Uh, to them because the media have been incredibly irresponsible in that debate. But, but um, the fact is that the state has to be in the home. It doesn't have to be in the home in the sense of a policeman sat there in the front room. It has to be in the home in the heads of both parents. And I think Britain, I'm very positive actually in this area. I think that Britain has a very pretty proud record of this and that in most cases it actually works. But in order for the state to be there, for there to be some kind of balance of authority and goodness, if you like, there, then, then, then there has to be a lot, of, a lot of policy that has to be talked about a lot in ways that might not necessarily um, be nice. In other words, you have to talk about it very aggressively for it, for it to be there at all. Um, you know, and there seat, you know, seat belts in cars and all kinds of other areas that, or other things that have come about that people did not want at the beginning and now everybody accepts. That's the first thing I want to say. The second thing I want to say is another positive thing. I think things, all I know from my own personal experience in my uh, brief time as a father so far, it is now much more acceptable to talk about being a dad uh, socially in practice regarded as a great, as a great thing. And um, uh, I've written a book about it and lots of people, no one said anything negative about it, so that's fine. <laughs> but they, they might have done 10, 15 years ago, you know, they might have gone through any day job kind of stuff. Third thing, fear. Now, I, 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 I'm, I'm very anti-fear. I don't think fear is a positive thing. I, I really, I, I, uh, I'm a recovering uh, addict myself. Uh, I, I know many, many, many people who, 
ended up in a great deal of trouble because they, because they, were, because they were frightened unnecessarily. Now, there are things you have to be frightened of, like cars in roads uh, and the wrong kind of people in playgrounds. But that's not the same, that's not the same as fear. And the father's role is certainly not to instill fear into children. Well, we have had generations of fathers that have done that, and, and we can see the, what, what, you know, the result of that. And you, you know, you know um, I think that fears cause unnecessary, fear causes unnecessary conflict. It literally causes wars. Uh, and um, over the generations, it, the, the, the male in the household has, you know, there's, there's someone next door that wants to come and get you. There's someone over the road that's going to come and get you. There's a bogeyman under the bed. Um, you know, and there's a paedophile in the, in, 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 the, uh, in the playground, blah, blah, blah. Well, unfortunately, sometimes that's true. But actually, the world is a pretty lovely place. Uh, and, there is, and there are lots of lovely things and lots of joyous things around. And that is a, a big role of a parent is to instill that in their, ch in their child, whether it's the mother uh, or the father. And the final thing I'd like to say is, uh, yes, women, women's role has changed, and that may be difficult for women. And I don't want to make what might appear to be an anti-female uh, case, partly because I'm getting married in a few weeks and it would be a good thing to do. But, but even in my life, in my lifetime, I have, I, as a father and, and, and as a man, I have had to completely recalibrate, compared to my father's generation, what my role is. I've had, to, I've had to go back to the drawing board on many occasions, and so so my generation. Uh, and, uh, and that's good. But uh, women also, um, uh, the consequence of, 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 of maiden dagging and feminism and so on is, is, that, is that women have to do that as well, uh, no matter how uncomfortable uh, uh, that is. Um, and um, that's, just, that's, just, that's just the case. You can't have one um, uh, without the other. You know, I've done lots of things in, in my life, some, some good, some bad, but the most important thing is definitely the bringing up of, of, of children. I don't think there's anything about that. Okay, hopefully there's been some interesting things from the panel, so I hope you people do have some questions. Um, yeah, we'll go there next week. Hi. Um, it seems that, you know, as we're talking about father's roles, except in the cases of single dads who kind of take over all the parenting roles, that it seems like dads are more involved, but in very specific way. Like, um, among the families I see, dad takes the kids to sports. He takes them out on a, um, on Sunday morning to the park and it, that's when all the other dads are there with their kids and all the mums are having a lion or whatever. And um, Also, I wonder, I guess a question for the panel, do we think that dads tend to be more involved with their sons versus daughters? I don't have an opinion about that, but just wondering. Um, but I, I think also that the, one of the challenges of father's roles is that uh, an increased role for dad bumps up against what's become a really strong social trend for moms to be a certain type of mom. Um, and often that can mean leaving work for a certain number of years to focus on parenting or whatever, or even self-defined roles within the family. So that, you know, is there room for dad's role to grow until <laughs> mom's role shrinks? I mean, I think as, or, any, all parents have that um, sort of a real juggling act to do, to, you know, juggling work and, and childcare. Um, and I think in that situation, usually, you know, people have to make sacrifices in terms of, you know, their careers and things. But I think t even taking into that all of that into account, a lot of the, the sort of a, a moves towards equality that people have talked about have meant you know um, sort of liberating experiences in terms of you know lots of women have being able to have lots uh, long successful careers and you know men staying at home etc. And I guess p part of all of this is that I, I think that you know clearly parents have a lot of difficult conversations and challenges they have to work out for themselves. Um, but every, everyone's situation is unique, whether it's, you know, how many children you've got, um, you know, what the, you know, the career aspirations of the individual parents. And I think, however well-intentioned it is, it just strikes me as slightly dangerous to start setting a tone and setting expectations of what a father should or shouldn't be, because it's going to be very unique to every single relationship. Um, you opened up talking about how um, the, the amount of fathering time people have done is increasing. As it's increased, you know, to, and, and you sort of implied that if that was to continue increasing, that that would be a good thing. And I'd say, you know, maybe for a lot of people that wouldn't be the case. Um, so I just think it's very dangerous to start making generalizations about what should be expected of, of a father. 
Uh, I'd just like to echo what Ellie said, really. Um, I think we should be on our guard about any policy interest in fathers in the same way that we'd be on our guard, or we should be on our guard in relation to mothers. Like in the past, I think interest in, in parents has tended to be an interest in mothers. And so we had the um, discussion about teenage mothers earlier on. Um, and I, I think rather than inviting in a greater interest, as Ellie said, in the name of equality, I think we should be uh, um, concerned about it because I think the impact of family policy over the past few years has actually been to the detriment of parents. It's actually undermined their confidence and their own abilities and uh, created the anxieties that the panel have discussed. So uh, I, I really do think this is something which uh, we shouldn't be inviting in. Sorry, um, again. Um, I was just um, thinking that um, you know, women fought for a long time for equality and to get out into the public world. And it seems to me that to some degree we have now achieved that possibility uh, to quite a large degree. Um, and rather than celebrating that um, in, in public discussion that takes place, we seem to uh, instead be concentrating on what happens uh, in intimate private life and how uh, fathers' roles have changed uh, in coming into, um, into the home, really. And, um, it, and then there seems to be a relationship between that and the, and the state um, through uh, promoting particular types of family life, um, getting involved in the home and elevating um, private life over public life. Yeah, I just wanted to, I, I wasn't really trying to ask a gender question, although I can understand why. I mean, I suppose, yeah. are, are we just turning both the male and the female into parents, I suppose, is what, it's, it's, it's almost like, it, are we creating a kind of hyper-privatised world in terms of that's all we are? And I relate to this in terms of a number of people I know, men, who they have a child and they say, but it's absolutely transformed my life. As soon as they say that, I sort of like start to distrust them. Um, and, then, and then you get this idea that being a parent is the most important thing in the world. And you kind of think that's funny because if, if you had a classroom of kids, or if you were talking to your child and you said, what do you want to be when you grow up? And you said, I want to be a parent. Your heart would probably sink. So what does it say about us if we're saying parenting is the greatest thing in my life? Uh, around some of this messaging, around this policy in which then parents you know, are reflecting and aren't double thinking about their relationship with their child. So I just wonder what the panel or the audience think about that. And Robert, I think Ellie's perhaps right to pick up and again, um, you know, maybe the men in the audience, the fathers in the audience, because if you go to your site, I mean, it is true, you know, you sort of the, the information, you can say, well, it's evidence, and in some ways you might be saying, well, it's neutral, but it, it really is, um, well, it's a pale version of what is given to mothers, isn't it? So, so I think it comes to two things. So, you know, you know, so the whole thing of pre, um, for pregnancy, how can fathers help their partner during pregnancy? Oh, don't, you know, the worst thing for a pregnant woman is to be stressful, so the father should tiptoe around and not create stress. So, so you know, which does seem to be a traduction, well it does, you know, but a lot, you know, breastfeeding, exactly the support, so it does seem to be a traduction of human relationships into this sort of medical and medicalised information, if that's the way we're talking to fathers really, I mean, it, you know, it is this, you know, the, the only thing you are is a handmaiden to your pregnant wife or then post-pregnant wife, it does seem to be a very invidious position in which that uh, the new father is being recast, if you like, from the, you know, the breadwinner into this slightly <laughs> shadow of the information that women are having. So, so you know, I don't know what people think about that, but, uh, you know, I do think Ellie's pertinent, perhaps, in saying some of those things that are there. So, kind of, let's go back again. Uh, whoever wants to. Do you need to be logical? You can jump in. <laughs> oh, well, I'll go first. Um, 
I, there is this question that if, if by providing information you are damaging family relationships, and I don't think you are. If, if medical science shows that if a parent smokes in the house, a two-year-old is more likely to get all kinds of problems later on health-wise, should we tell parents about that or not? I think we should. And rather than what's happened over the last 30 years, which is we'll tell the mothers about that, but we won't need to tell the fathers about that. I think that's wrong. I think if once we decide to tell parents stuff, we should tell both of them. Um, and I agree with David, the state is in the room. Uh, when, when we had our first child, I looked at this baby, and um, amongst all the emotions I felt, I had one really strong uh, worry, which was the fact that it was the first relationship in my life where I couldn't just say, I'm sorry, I don't like you, I'm leaving, uh, <laughs> without any legal consequences. If you say that to a girlfriend, okay, it's sad, but we get over it. If you say that to a baby, that's actually willful neglect and it's a criminal <laughs> offence. So it is a legal relationship between a parent and a child um, <laughs> for all kinds of reasons. Um, um, just to pick up on some other questions, though, do dads do a certain kind of thing with their kids? They definitely do. And there's lots of research that shows that dads interact with their kids differently to how mums interact with their children. Not, it doesn't question their basic competence. A dad is as competent as a mother to cook, clean, and care. But dads are more likely to engage in, in play, which is a little bit more risky than mums, for example. And so you would come up with the idea that actually it's great for a child to be exposed to both of those kinds of parenting. And the gender equity thing, is there room for dad's role to grow? Uh, without mums actually having to give something up. Um, I don't think there is, really. I think with equal pay for women and rights in the workplace, we have set in chain something whose waves are still rippling out and the dominoes are still dropping. And one of the dominoes is, if you're saying that the workplace is no longer a male domain, then you also need to say that the home is no longer the female domain. And that the dominoes are slowly dropping down there. If we're sharing workspaces, we ought to be able to share home spaces. And I think that's actually quite a difficult domino to drop. Very, very difficult. And you often find people arguing that there are things that women can do and ought to be doing that men aren't quite going to be quite so good at. Um, and that takes you down the road into gender differences. Um, and I think that's so we're still in that area. That, that area there. Okay. Richard? Yeah, I, yes. so I, think, I, think, I think Rob's absolutely right there. There are clear implications here for women and women's agency. You're absolutely right on that. But there are dangers, I think. There's a, there's a great book called Contemporary Fathering by a woman called Bruce Featherstone. And she talks about how it's really unlikely that good outcomes for children are going to be encouraged by promoting father involvement against the wishes of mothers. And one of the arguments that's been made by some feminist writers is that what's actually going on here, there's a bit of a kind of lecturing to mothers here about things, and women's voices are often invisible in this. And I, I come partly from the law background, and there are concerns there in relation to, say, debates around contact. Is it the case, as some argue, that some mothers are encouraged to a greater contact where there might be genuine risks? What is going on in relation to debates around unmarried dads, for example? What's happening to the voices of women in this? So it's a bit of a balance to Rob's point there and genuine concerns about what this does mean for women and for children. So it's very complicated. Um, okay. Yeah, I have a genuine question about whether there is any evidence that good parenting produces good children. Um, for about 10 years now, I've listened to Desert Island Discs every single week. And uh, without exception on those, they've got the most awful parents. Uh, you know, their fathers were completely distant, their mothers were in bed with depression for 20 years, and all these talented geniuses kind of made it on their own. And I think um, uh, David's point about seatbelts, it just can't be compared to that. You know, we know that wearing seatbelts reduces accidents, but I don't know that we do know that this new vision of good parenting produces... Um, good children. I think there was, a, there was an amazing session that my colleague here organised uh, last year or the year before about adoption and the whole tortuous process for deciding who were good enough to adopt. And I think John Harris 
made an absolutely brilliant point. There is no test for parenting. It just doesn't work. And there are heroin addicts who've been heroin addicts for 20 years who get pregnant, come off heroin, and become the most amazing parents, much better than the depressed ones who, of these talented people who stayed in bed for 20 years. Um, word that was just dropped in um, to the conversation a little while ago by Jane was um, handmaiden that the father, the role that's envisaged for the father here um, is as the mother's handmaiden because I've been sitting here in the audience trying to work out what actually what useful role a father could play in um, those <laughs> early days because you, I mean, and it's not about you know it's not about gender. I mean. I, agree with what Stuart said a few uh, minutes ago. I don't think that it matters which way round it is. I mean, it could be, um, you know, the mother going out and engaging with the outside world and going to work and the father staying at home looking after, you know, changing baby's nappies and so on. And obviously that's happening more and more and, you know, that's, that's a, a great development in my view. But the idea of both people being obsessed with um, the private they're worried about, um, you know, what's in the baby's poo and all the rest of it that you get obsessed with in the early days. I just actually can't see a useful role for um, the other person. I can't see anything that they could do other than either be a sort of nagging kind of uh, voice, you know, in um, the primary carer's ear, sort of saying, oh, you shouldn't have that drink, and, you know, you shouldn't be changing the nappy like that, and so on and so forth. Or they can only be, um, you know, a handmaid, and there's... Um, Jane described, and I always remember, I mean, I did read all, because I'm, you know, I'm a mother, not a father, I read all the books, and I got very anxious when I had my first child, and I always remember reading um, those terrible books by the Sears about attachment parenting, and they were obviously kind of ahead of their time, because they were very concerned about getting fathers involved, and what they, and obviously they're very pro-breastfeeding as well, so that's a bit of a problem for them. And what they suggested was that it was very important that in the middle of the night, the mother woke the father up, maybe by kicking him, and he had to go and get the baby from the baby's crib and carry the baby to the mother so that the mother could breastfeed. And even in my sort of befuddled state of having just had my first baby, I just thought, you know, what a horrible role for a father. How absolutely demeaning of his masculinity, and I'm not talking here about men necessarily, it could be the, the other way around, but how demeaning of any kind of role of engaging with the outside world and having a bit of respect for um, the, you know, the, the facing outward of uh, perhaps at least one person um, in um, the family. So I suppose my question is, is there really in this any kind of positive role that can be played by what will normally be the father. And I suppose my question, my other question, particularly um, to Richard and perhaps to um, Ellie, picking up on some things that Richard was saying earlier on, is, is this um, vision of fatherhood part of a, a broader attack on masculinity and masculine values and the idea of engaging with the outside world and, and looking outward rather than inward? So, and then that's it. Very, very quick uh, question. Um, I'm, I'm just curious as to what disaster Robin, uh, Robin, uh, David think uh, is going to fall society if parents are allowed to muddle through in the way in which previous <coughs> generations were. I mean, it's very easy in these discussions to lose sight of the fact that, that uh, you know, the discourse around parenting is it's comparatively recent, and that bringing up children was just a banal activity. Uh, it's just something that people did, you know, without advice, you know, without websites and certainly without having the state uh, in the room necessarily. Um, so I'm, I'm curious as to what's going to happen to society if parents are just allowed to negotiate these things between themselves uh, as, uh, as adults. Okay, well, um, a minute or just a very quick brief one. I know there's still loads out there, but you know, the discussion goes on with uh, a glass of wine at the... Imperial College or wherever we're going to afterwards. So, David, I'll start from you and then go the other way around. David. Well, I've only got a minute. I hardly know where to start, really, but I'll be as quick as I can. Um, 
As far as what good could it do? I mean, we're, we are but young, really. We're 180 generations since Stonehenge. That's all we are. Uh, twice in the last 100 years, nearly the entire male population has been wiped out. Uh, and we think where we are now in 2010, that we know everything, we don't know anything. Um, and I, I, well, we know something, but we know, very, we know very little. And, you know, are we a healthy society? That's a very, very, you know, I'm not talking in terms of, <coughs> of, you know, not being ill. I'm talking about mental health. We're not. Are most men in, in Britain, you know, well-adjusted and fully? No, no, they're not. I think if you ask most women, they probably agree. Uh, there's a lot there. In fact, you know, I could be more extreme, but I won't be. Um, one other thing, you know, what is the most important thing that we do? Why are we here? What is, is, is it not parenting if you have children? If you don't have children, that's different. You know, one of the things I had to do when I was working for, 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 for Murdoch was go to funerals for very famous people, people who were born on Desert Island Discs and, you know, members of the royal family. The only thing that matters at that moment, the only thing that's left is love and children. Those are the only things that actually matter. You know, and we live in a society now where you know, we, we, talk, we, 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 we talk about 16 year olds and we give them vocational training. We define them at the age of 16 to go and do something and that's them. Is that really what life's about? Of course it's not. It's about all kinds of, all kinds of other things that are far more important than that. And you know, it, uh, I, I, you know I remember when my son was born, just for the, the, thir the thought that occurred to me just for the moment was just at that particular moment here was the the, the newest member of the human race. It would only have been for a millisecond, probably less than that, because, you know, but just at that moment, that's what that was. And that is the essence of, of, of our existence. And without that, we don't, we don't we, we, you know, and we, and we dismiss parenting as if it's just another thing. It's not another thing. It is the most vital thing that we do as human beings. Yeah, to be very brief, that was, that was a great question about the, um, is this vision a broader attack on masculinity? It seems to me that the changes in fatherhood we're talking about in this session, which are so complex and multi-layered, they're bound up with really significant shifts in ideas about masculinity, and I think they go hand in hand. So if we trace it through 50s, 60s to the 70s, it's in the 70s when you begin to get these debates emerging, I think. In the 80s through to the 90s, what happens in the 90s? A crisis of masculinity. This whole idea kind of takes off. And the origins of a lot of the politics of fatherhood that we're talking about go back to the 90s, the Child Support Act debates, those concerns when Labour were talking about being tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. We can trace it back to that. And what we now have is this high-profile debate, notably around contact and residence, and what's happened over the last 10 years. So this is high political, and I think, yes, it is bound up in issues about masculinity. Uh, very, there was a great question earlier, sorry, about... Um, the leisure time and sons and daughters and does it make a difference? I don't know the answer to that. But what I do think is that there's all this question of diversity. Does it matter if we're parenting only children, girls, boys, teenagers? There's such diversity there. And what we need to remember is we have individual biographies. And this is absolutely crucial. So there are real dangers in generalising all of this. And finally, that question at the back was fantastic there. What, what does it say about us if parenting is the greatest thing in our life. Well, maybe at the end of the day, I wonder, how do we make choices? How do we make it so people can make the choice to care? And at the end of the day, and in the present economic climate, how does our society actually really value care and caring? And does it matter whether it's done by a man or a woman? Because sometimes I wonder about how much caring actually really is valued. Okay, thanks. Um, the masculinity one is fascinating, isn't it? Because I think masculinity changed. It used to be considered a threat to one's masculinity if one washed too often. Um, and I think we've got over that now. And I think, you know, if we all hold hands in a masculine way, we can probably cope with pushing prams and making sandwiches. Um, the Desert Island Disc Point is great, and it reminds me, in Jeremy Paxman's book about prime ministers, he found that an incredibly high percentage of prime ministers had suffered the loss of a parent during their childhood. And so maybe it is true that awful childhoods produce high achievers, um, but the evidence would show that awful childhoods have more likelihood to produce adults with difficulties themselves. And finally, what happens if we stop telling people what to do? 
I've never argued that we should tell people what to do. I argue strongly that we should tell people uh, facts. Families, as far as possible, should be intervention-free zones, but they shouldn't be information-free zones. They really shouldn't. Um, and I don't know quite what would happen, but I have noticed that in the last 50 years since we started doing big public health information programs, infant mortality is down to 25% of where it used to be. So I would guess that if we don't give parents health messages, infant mortality would go up, as well as lots of other problems that we want to put behind us. Thank you. Um, we can. For a whole set of reasons, there just isn't time to go into. I think the large proportion of what today is oftentimes described as information has got nothing to do with facts, and it's also got nothing to do with informing, um, and it's got nothing to do with giving people choices. Um, it's a one-sided reading of the literature, it's ignorant of massive amounts of research, it cherry-picks studies, um, and there's a whole industry of people involved in providing this information who actually don't have the ability to properly um, understand the complexities of the literature anyway, but everybody just seems to think it's a really good thing to get into the game. Um, and I think there's a whole load of costs associated with this particular development um, around what's now called informed choice. Um, the one thing I think we can be absolutely certain of about what's happened over the past decade and a half, there's been a huge expansion of parenting time, then increasing anxiety on the part of parents about whether they're spending enough time with their children. Um, so there's a conundrum to work out. Um, clearly the fact that we expand parenting time <coughs> on the part of both men and women, regardless of how much they're working, um, so this doesn't match with whether you work full-time, part-time, whatever, it's what all the time you should study show. The more we expand parenting time, it certainly doesn't give us a feeling of spending enough time with our kids. So there's clearly something else going on here. And I worry about just going further down this route, which is clearly, at the moment, the route that we're headed in, which is to keep expanding parenting time and keep having more and more schemes which attempt to expand parenting time. All it seems to do is create a situation where people worry about whether they're spending enough time with their kids. Um, and what we can also be sure about, which is a point that's been raised already, is the other thing that's gone along with this, is a phenomenal restriction um, of children's free time. And clearly these two things must be related the one to the other. So overall I think that the, the route that we're headed down so far is not one that I want to see continuing. Um, and that isn't because I think social policy is redundant or anything like that, but I think we need to have a, you know, a much more sort of clear-headed and analytical look about where this way of going at things has you know, got us hitherto, and whether we really want to just keep ploughing on down the same furrow, because it's not doing us very much good at the moment, is it? Well, thank you very much. Uh, before we thank the panel, can I just say the festival reception is starting now in the Queen's Tower Rooms at Imperial College, five-minute walk, and if you meet at the JMU's entrance at the RCA, we can walk down together. So can uh, thank the panel. Thank you.